about digital policy making. And what I recognized from, from the outside perspective, first of all, I mean, you're just doing whatever you want. So I, I have the idea that, or the impression that you basically are dynamic enough and quickly enough to actually make change happen in Estonia. And I was wondering, why is that not happening somewhere else? So what is unique at Estonia and why do you think, have you been able to do that, what you've just shown? Um, well, first of all, if you ask in Estonia, we are not doing enough. <laughs> Mm. So, especially if you go around, you know, uh, for example, even asking on the street, you know, people always want more. And I think that's also a good part is that so once you start going down the path, especially as government, it becomes like a virtuous circle in a way. So the job for us is to catch up and basically deliver more in a way. Mm -hmm. But leaving that aside and going to the heart of your question, I think there's a few sort of factors that I can't comment for the other countries, but that we have benefited from. But one of them is really um, the issue of leadership, which is, you know, what these two days are about in a way. So our little luck has been that we basically have had political and also administrative leaders who uh, basically have not been afraid to experiment, just like you know uh, Jeremy was saying in a way. Not play around with tech themselves, but allow others to do it for them, or you know, for the government in a, in a way. Um, a government CIO always calls it basically that they've trusted our engineers, right? Mm -hmm. But the other part, and I think this really ties to what uh, Jean-Jacques was sort of saying in a way, is that so, yes, the sort of threats are there, but let's say we've had a lot of let's say, belief that we can deal with the threats. So the big sort of difference in mindset is for us is that so we try to solve a problem, not you know hide away if it arises, be it a security threat, be it sort of you know uh, 2007 cyber attacks, whatever like that in a way. And the third thing, and then you know of course you can get past that is that size helps. So being small helps a bit, and not in the sense that basically somehow your job of transformation is is easier by uh, because government procedures are very similar in all places, but the number of people you have to convince is smaller. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Okay, when I look at my, my structure of like technology in the middle, I mean the technology is there, every gov government could use yeah. it, uh, but then the leadership is probably right in the story I did it. And what, what makes me curious is you said the reactions from the society was very positive, mm -hmm. um, and they're now demanding more than, than ever. Um, and when I talk to companies or, or other um, government leaders, they actually say, well, we're not sure if they really want it. How, how was the reaction? When did you actually introduce the first services and like yep. and e residency and, and like what do you get feedback now? Well, we really started with the first of services for the public in 1990, 2000. So mm -hmm. it's been like seven, 16, 17 years now in the making in that sense. Um, our little sort of curious part is so from very early on, we were not really uh, user oriented as we should have been. So in some sense, basically, you know, government was innovating in the blind, but it so happened that, that you know, as we were going after the pain points of people's lives, they wanted these to be solved. So anything that made your life better, yes, I don't have to, you know, have paper slips to provide for my tax declaration. They appreciated that. Mm -hmm. These days, uh, we are much more uh, fine-grained and much more sort of basically, you know, building for the users. So if you mentioned e-residency, which we started two years ago, the, the whole concept, the whole way it's played out, the sort of the products and services we develop for e-residents, e it all comes from the feedback. It comes, all comes from basically, what are these guys saying that they want from this? Mm -hmm. People who got the e-residency, are they now also emotionally attached to Estonia more? Or? Well, there's a few e-residents here, you can ask them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll get to that later. So Jean-Jacques, a question to you. I mean, you're a, a kind of a pioneer in that, in that space and I mean, like, in the digital or internet governance and policy making since a very long time. What are the key changes if you look back the last 10 years? I mean, technology changes so quickly. Uh, how does it affect policy making? And what do you see like as a key development for the next couple of years as a challenge and as an opportunity? I think that's, that's a really good question, um, which I thought about actually when preparing the, the, for today, um, because I've, I mean, I used to work in government, and when I worked in, in the private sector, and I spent a lot of the 2000s, or at least it's a feeling I have, a lot of the 2000s trying to explain how good the internet is, and that it was so important that politicians and regulators should pay attention because it's a good thing. And <coughs> it seems that very quickly over the past five years, maybe, it's turned from politicians and regulators saying, oh, it's that weird internet stuff out there, yes, yeah, for the youngies, young people, 
to, oh my God, the internet is here and it's affecting our economies and our societies and, oh, we need to control it. I, I am simplifying, of course, but that has been the amazing thing. So it's sort of ha having spent almost 10 years having real trouble getting the attention of the really senior political decision makers to now having almost too much attention from the senior policy, uh, political decision makers. And maybe partly because they haven't had that awareness over the period, we're faced with increasingly knee-jerk reactions. And that's my real concern, that uh, instead of uh, remembering all the good stuff about the internet, and I think the internet and digital technologies have been overwhelmingly positive for, for the world, for all of us, uh, people tend to focus on, on just the problems. And mm -hmm. um, that's, that's my real concern today. And that's, uh, that's where I think there is a voice for, for the digital industry. And I actually forgot to ask a question at the end. My question to everyone was going to be, you know, what are you going to do to ensure that your business can flourish, uh, whatever digital governance comes up, uh, rather than be hammered by new regulation, maybe even have your business closed down or some of your products uh, closed or declared illegal, because that's the reality and that's mm -hmm. happening a lot. Uh, I hope that not many of you have been have been impacted by that, but it, it is happening, and so we need. I think we need to continue to explain to, police, to, to, to politicians, but also just generally public opinion, all the good stuff about the internet. But we need to also help them maybe be creative about how they approach the issues. Mm -hmm. In a way, we should be creative internally as a sort of digital industry in taking into account governance. You know, things about you know concerns about privacy. Well, we should think about can we integrate privacy within the design of our software? Can we have a privacy by design in our software development process? For some of the apps out there, it's completely feasible. Some of them are even looking at human rights by design. It's an interesting concept. Depends what your app is about or your, your software, of course. So we can think about being innovative in how we approach regulation, but similarly, we should try and get political decision makers to think a bit more creatively. Mm -hmm. And. Then when we look on the other side of the industries, the, the economy, the businesses actually, um, I mean, without government and e-government and, and also your regulation, um, we basically couldn't do any digital business. So I think that's the, the backbone. Um, what are the industry leaders or the business leaders demanding from you to do and to change? Are there any specific topics they're asking for? Well, I think there's a lot of awareness raising mm -hmm. uh, and, and sort of capacity building. A lot of people just, again, don't understand digital very well, um, including the regulatory context over it. Uh, so a lot of people are trying to, you know, this, this, is, this is an industry that's been, that's been brought together by the tech community and now it's branching out all of a sudden to, you know, Industry 4.0. I think, yeah, there's a lot of education that's needed and, mm -hmm. um, and people don't always know where it is. So that's why we do things like, like today. Yeah. Try and raise awareness, bring them in. Um, and I think it's not that you don't have the opportunity to, to do business. I mean, the basic rules are there, but there's just a misunderstanding or a lack of uh, good understanding of, okay, well, we've got this brand new digital world. Do we need a new law? Mm -hmm. How do we approach it? Yeah. And to me, I mean, legislation, you know, the right to privacy hasn't really changed. It's just that we've got new technologies that impact on privacy. So we just have to think a little bit outside the box. And if you're a regulator, all you think about is putting a tick on the box, mm. in the box. So it's, uh, you need a big evolution in mindset. You know, people moving into the 21st century, unfortunately, that's as simple as it is. And I think that's true for governments as it is for industries. Mm -hmm. It's really a change in mindset. We mentioned the definition of digital governance. It's mind-boggling that if you look at the leadership of a lot of companies out there that have to embrace the digital issues, they don't really have anyone that's really leading on this. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of them have got the CIOs. CIOs just, you know. and, and bring it down to a more practical level. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the early internet age until very recently, there was the domain landscape with top-level top domains mm -hmm. kind of limited. So you had the country-level domains and then... Mm -hmm mainly .com and like other, uh, a couple of these top level domains, but now you did a big, big change. Um, can you explain what you did and how it was accepted in the market? Yeah, so there was, there's been a lot of push over the past 10 years or so for the introduction of more to, uh, generic top level domains. So a lot of the demand was actually coming from German industry people because the if you wanted a site, and <clears throat> I often get the example given to me, in 2005, you're trying to register a site in .de in Germany. 
there were already 12 million .de domains. So you were pretty sure that your site was already taken. Whatever your name was, whatever your company was. Metzger.de has been taken ages ago. Um, and so there's this push to say, well, there's actually only 22 such generic top-level domains, uh, apart from the country codes. So you have .de, .fr, .lu for Luxembourg. Okay, there's 200 of those. But then in terms of generics, like .com, .info, there were only 22. So the idea and demand was, well, can we just open that up? And uh, so after various years of uh, those uh, discussions amongst interested stakeholders within the, 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 the ICANN committees, uh, there's a big program launched, and uh, we've just had over a 1,000 extra uh, generic top-level domains added to the Internet's route. So you now can register things like .web, or soon, you know, this hasn't been formally launched, I think, uh, .ninja, for those, those that like it, uh, or, you know, there's all sorts, uh, .music, .blog, .etc., etc. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot more choice, and... The objectives of the program are, not, are both to, to give more choice, but also to bring more competition, because mm -hmm. there are only 22 domains and only a dozen or so actors behind those domains. Now there's several dozen. Uh, and there's opportunities for innovation as well, depending on you know, the, the sort of marketing you can develop and the strategy mm -hmm. you can develop. Uh, TV companies thinking about how they can use that for different channels. So you have uh, Dot Sky, for instance, for the Rupert Murdoch TV empire. So they have you know, German Dot Sky, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, so that, that'll be interesting to see how it works. It's already, it's, only, it's been launched uh, just over two years ago, and now it's already uh, over 10% of the, the GTLD market. So it's, uh, it's, it's starting to take shape, and I think we'll, uh, over the next couple of years, I think we'll, we'll hear much more about it. And then there's considerations already about, do we do another round? So yeah. uh, lots of brands in particular are very interested to have the dot, like BMW has its dot BMW, Audi has dot Audi. I don't think Mercedes has got dot Mercedes <laughs> yet, so they want to be next. The opportunity still. Yeah. Let's turn to Jeremy. Uh, I think you are, as a creative leader since many years, you've seen how companies are struggling with the change in digital, and you are now part with Introtech um, in, on the investor side. So how, what role does digital policy play for you? And as, as you talk to these leaders, I mean, I have the perspective that as a digital leader, you have to see the iceberg before it hits the Titanic. Basically, you have to look forward and, and create a vision which you talked about, um, which is more long-term thinking than, than practical day-to-day -day business. What are your thoughts on that? And what's the impact on, on digital policy from your perspective? I think policy is extremely important, although I also it hinders innovation. So I, I think a lot of times, this is my, you guys are definitely more up-to-date with me, but my, my, my take on that is a lot of times we companies and people try to innovate something, and then government is so slow, I mean, to put it no other way, they're just slow, they just cannot keep up. And you mentioned this, right? So the question for me is, I mean, and being American, living in Germany, it's, it's a strange uh, paradox. Um, so on one side, I'm, I'm quite liberal, but on the other side, I'm, you know, I live in a very conservative setting. So, I mean, I always, it's interesting to understand why people, and maybe this is somewhat naive, but why people put so much trust in their governments I mean, obviously, they're elected officials and stuff like that, but, and, and, you know, but on the other hand, you know, we know businesses are there for the most part because it's profit. So, but people put a lot of trust in businesses, too, if you think about Google, right? So I think policy is extremely important. Uh, if you think about insure tech, obviously, insurance is very well, uh, have, has a lot of policies. But I think a lot of times when you, when I work with startups, they're just trying to solve a problem. And the policy thing comes later. I mean, if I was to be still at Google, I worked at Google for the last four years, you know, even when I, I did a lot of public speaking, you always have to, you're supposed to always have a policy person when you talk to press when you work at Google, just in case you say something like, I don't know, Larry's, I don't know, Larry's not cool or something, I don't know, whatever. But um, the point there is, there, it's, it's extremely important. I think, for me, the bigger picture is, uh, we, and uh, you mentioned this as well, there's, there's kind of a, a race or a war to see what country or what city is like the startup you know, where are all the startups attracting? Where are they going to go? Because it's, it's been, been noted quite often that startups actually bring jobs. The existing companies don't bring jobs. Mm -hmm. So I was just in Zurich, and they've really stepped up. So I think what's interesting is with policy and governments is how can those two dance together? I think that's though, then you'll see interesting stuff. But if it's, it's us against them, industry against the, uh, the government and the policies, 
then it hinders innovation. But if you can get the two together, then you're gonna win. And I think a country like Luxembourg or like Switzerland in this case, where it's relatively small, Estonia, it's a lot easier, of course. There's a lot less um, mouths to feed, so to speak, or people to think about. Maybe Tim, you, you wanna comment on that as well. And I think especially taking into, into account that are you approached by a lot of other governments to actually learn from you or yeah. are you going out and, and, and teaching them? Well, in a way, we are shy that you know we can't really teach us because we don't know the context. Because you know, the thing here is that so, uh, in a way, governance always comes with the background, context, and culture, right? I mean, the reason why I said you know why stuff is easier done in Estonia because there's less people to convince. Well, we are a very flat government as well. National tier run, runs the show. Local has some authority, no level in between. You go go to the U.S. right, right? You go to Germany, three tiers immediately, right? With a quite different sort of set of powers, and that's also you know digital sort of. Uh, transformation needs and, and capacity. So my point here is that so uh, we do share what we've done, we do share how we've been doing this, what have been our lessons learned. Uh, we'd also like to learn back, by the way. So many things we do are actually built on other experiences as well. Our digital identity, uh, we basically copied from Finland, right? Mm -hmm. We did the only one innovation, we made it mandatory, so that made it work. But uh, beyond that, so basically, yes, we, we do go around, we do get asked to go around, we, we get lots of visitors, but but not that much on the governance side, and now that's going back to the question in a way. So the trick here is what I definitely see, and the same in my country, is that um, you said yourself that you know in a way digital transformation is also about you know aligning, realigning tech and sort of the business, meaning here how the government sort of operates or governance operates and the culture of things. When it comes to governance, political classes and masses are often very conservative about keeping the power away, and this is what we, why sort of my sort of hypothesis is that's why we don't see enough digital governance sort of innovations happening because they don't really want to tinker with it. Hmm. Uh, bottoms up, stuff comes up, but it only can go so far unless from top down also changes sort of uh, willingness is there. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like being an e-government means giving power away. So that's what he said. Like basically we do the infrastructure At least that it, it works does without... Does it for it? Does it chance for it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. without our engagement. Um, I'd, I'd like to wrap up the, the panel and I really would like to... Uh, thank everybody here. So, especially Jeremy, Jean-Jacques, and Seem, thanks for sharing this art. So everybody give him a big round of applause. It was great. <laughs>